Welcome to the Massachusetts School of Law Educational Forum. Thank you for joining us. This program is brought to you by the Massachusetts School of Law and is shown nationwide. The topic for today's show, people and their pets. A survey by the American Pet Products Manufacturers Association reports that the people in the United States own a total of 141 million dogs and cats. That's 68 million dogs, 73 million cats. This does not even include the wide variety of birds, of reptiles, fish, and other animals that humans choose as their pets. Pets are often our very favorite companions. Why is this so? Does the unique bond we share with our pets dramatically enrich our life, our physical health, and our emotional well-being? Well, despite the love and security that many of us provide for our pets, the Humane Society of the United States estimates four to five million cats and dogs are euthanized in shelters each year. Even more live miserable, dangerous lives on the streets. Is there a way to solve the problem of unwanted pets? Finally, how can we provide for our pets in the event that they outlive us? In the next hour, we'll examine the bond between people and their pets. Joining me, Kai Yoon Cho is the Finney's Friends Program Coordinator at the MSPCA, a program that assists people that live with HIV AIDS and their companion animals to stay together despite the many challenges that they may face. She shares her life with two very lovable dogs. Welcome to the show. Thank nice you for joining me. Yes. Attorney Peggy Hoyt practices in the areas of trust and estate planning and administration, probate and real estate. She is the author of a very wonderful book entitled All My Children Wear Fur Coats, How to Leave a Legacy for Your Pets. It's very worth reading. She has four cats. She has three dogs, two wild Mustang horses, and a filly that was rescued from a slaughterhouse auction. Delighted you could join us, thank and you thank you for all the good work you're doing. Dr. Alan M. Beck is the director of the Center for the Human-Animal Bond in the School of Veterinary Medicine at Purdue University. The center was established to develop a comprehensive understanding of the relationship between people and their companion animals. Dr. Beck has authored The Ecology of Stray Dogs and co-authored the very popular book Between People and Their Pets. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Beck. My pleasure. And all the hard work you're doing, you'll have Thank to you. tell us about your latest research <laughs> projects. And I'm Diane Sullivan, your host for today's program. Panel, again, <laughs> welcome to the show. Let's begin by discussing the bond between people and their pets. Dr. Beck, I'm going to start with you. Why do people form such close bonds with their pets? The easiest thing is to remember that we're a very social animal, that the most important part of our environment is each other. Mm -hmm. And we have learned, as have other social animals, to include other social animals as sort of compatriots. So we can relate to a, a, a dog or a cat as if it's part of our family, and they relate to us as if we're part of their family. <laughs> and we therefore can really share some of the benefits that we have for each other with our animals. And in fact, all the health benefits of why animals are important to us are exactly the same as why people are important mm -hmm. to us. And we're going to talk about some of those health right. benefits in just a moment. I wonder if one of you may discuss with the audience the, the history of the coevolution of, I think of people and pet, but it might be people and other, uh, other types of, uh, of animals, such as even horses, but mostly people and dogs. For me, it begins with the working dog. Am I right about that? Sure. We, animals are always very important to us. They're the most important part of our environment, so we would have to pay attention to them, either because we'd want to eat them or because they were going to eat us. Mm -hmm. And we've learned, uh, probably as we started living in, in communities around 14,000 years ago in villages, when we, we started taking wolves out of, of dens and we kept the, the cute ones and we kept raising them. And as, pets? Fun, as pets? As pets. Uh, in fact, one theory is that actually was our, we are such a nurturing type that we're very attracted to things that we can care for and nurture. But of course, the, the, the tame wolves and eventually the dogs that lived around us would eat our garbage, would alert us to other animals and so on. And now all, all cultures have a history of at least some kind of domestic animal pet relationship. That's right. How does that account for the fact, though, that people have developed today such close relationships with their cats, for example. How did that all come about? The cats liked us. In fact, they probably 
auto They tolerate owners. us. They, they <laughs> tol that, that's true. Yeah. Oh, right. As I said, dogs have owners, cats have staff. Oh, that's uh, yes. And uh, they took advantage of our garbage, our availability, our protection, our food. Mm -hmm. And it became a, just a nice mutual relationship. We, we learned to really understand each other's signals. In fact, the dog, more than any other animal, really understands human uh, nonverbal communication. That's right. Peggy, I notice you have more than a, a handful of cats and dogs. But typically, are people either cat people or dog people, or is that a myth? I think sometimes you hear people say that I'm a dog person, I'm not a cat person, but I think there's probably just as many people out there who are both. Mm -hmm. And I fall into that category, and probably if you had to pin me down, I'd say I'm more of a horse person. Cayune, mm -hmm. <laughs> how about yourself? Um, I agree with what Pe Peggy had said. Um, certainly there are different kinds of people who own dogs versus those that own cats. Certainly cats are more independent and you don't have to um, provide them with the same type of care you would a dog. Um, you can just take off for a few days on vacation or if you want to go away for a weekend without finding somebody to walk the dogs and do all the care that they do need versus a cat who can be left home alone for a couple of days. And cats would typically be better, I'm assuming, for lots of people who have small quarters like an absolutely, apartment and so absolutely. forth. Absolutely. There was somebody who was ill who, for example, with the people that I work with in my program, a lot of them suffer a great illness. So um, sometimes they're hospitalized and they're not able to provide the care for the cat that they're able to and they're away from home for a few days and their neighbors will come in and be able to provide the uh, substitute care for their animals. Do you have a number of clients that have HIV, that have dogs, and, and how do you help those people? Um, majority of my clients are cat owners, mm -hmm. um, so obviously minority <coughs> of them have dogs. Um, we provide them with volunteers who will go in their homes and help them with the dog walking because sometimes they're so ill they can't even physically get up to be able to do that, or they'll go through chemotherapy and not, and not able to change a litter box for their cats, mm -hmm. for instance. So we provide very extensive and comprehensive services to each individual client in our program. And what would happen upon the passing of one of your clients that leaves an animal? Oh, it's the toughest situation. Um, majority of them do not have a plan in place. And as we and I had discussed earlier, um, to have that plan in place is so crucial because we want to do right by both the owner, the client, and the animals and um, sometimes we're left with the ownership of the animals and we try to find the best suitable home for right. the animal. So it's a tough situation. Well, we'll talk with Peggy a little bit later about how one provides for their, their pet in the event of, of one's That's demise. Nice. Um, some people have argued, you know, you always hear people that personally I think they don't like animals. So they say, oh, people who have pets have this close bond with their, their dog or their cat because they are unable, they are not capable of forming a close relationship with other people. Is there any truth to that rumor? There's probably problems in isolated people everywhere. But if mm -hmm. you look at who has dogs and cats, they mm -hmm. are much, much more common. Mm -hmm. In families that are married people are much more common with, with pets. If you have a child over six under 14, you're about 14 times more common to have dogs and cats there. They're a part of the family dynamic. They're not mm -hmm. a instead of. For some isolated people, they might be. Mm -hmm. And that's OK, too. But they are, for the most part, a very socializing part. One of the major roles animals play in people's lives is it helps other people interact. It actually encourages human-human contact. Yeah. People with pets are perceived to be more positive, more common, mm -hmm. so it's easier to talk to. Mm -hmm. It's I mean, it's very easy to come over and say, what a nice animal you exactly. have. There's it's sort of a bridge between of people. Of course. Yep. Isn't that what they recommend, too, if for men who are looking to attract <laughs> women, they should get a dog and walk it in the park, or right. a puppy, particularly? <laughs> now, I have a chow chow who has a ton of fur. My brother says to me, I have a brother much younger than myself, and he says to me one day, he and his friend are going to borrow my dog to go to the beach. Okay? <laughs> my dog who can't stand it when it's over 60 degrees. I, I said, you most certainly funny. are not. Uh, Why do you want to take the dog? Uh, and then it dawned on me, oh, course, they want to use the dog are out, <laughs> right. to That's attract right. girls. Oh, and my. we should remember, by the way, that politicians have been doing this for years. As soon as a politician gets in trouble, mm -hmm. they're paired with a dog or cat. You know, because I don't like to slam them. presidents, but, you know, President Clinton is in <laughs> trouble and arrives the dog. <laughs> You're absolutely right.
<laughs> so, and it, it is a well-known, established thing that people feel more comfortable in the presence of animals. In fact, that's probably why more people go to zoos every year than all spectator sports combined. Is that right? Because wow. in the zoo environment, it is mm. comfortable. It's safe. You mm -hmm. can chat. Mm -hmm. yeah. you, you, you assume you're there for good reasons. Mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. like just being in a park. Mm -hmm. And I have found, and Peggy, I don't know if you'd comment on this, but people, they look at me, I don't have any children, and I have two dogs, and they say, oh, we'll tolerate this in her because she's simply supplementing the dogs for her kids. I've heard that quite a bit, and of course, my 10 children are my only children, so I always introduce myself as saying I don't have any two-legged children, but I have a household <laughs> full of four-legged children, and I think we're seeing that a lot more today. Um, people that are waiting longer to have children or not having children at all are, and I'm not going to say substituting children with pets, but they, they are extensions of us as individuals. They are part of our family, as Dr. Beck said, and um, not having any children, I still have a huge family of children and a <laughs> huge family of responsibilities. Let me ask you whether the bonds between people and pet are, are different than person to person, or are they really the same? I think there's the same model. Of course there are differences. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the things we do with people is talk. Mm -hmm. Well, we talk about 99% of people talk to their dogs and cats, and 1% lied, actually, what we did. So <laughs> yeah, everybody talks to dogs. We, we want to, to touch. We find comfort in hugging, kissing. We do that with our, with our animals. Uh, we, we like to have a sort of distraction so we talk to each other, but animals are a wonderful focus of attention, whether it be dog, cat, bird, mm -hmm. fish tank. Mm -hmm. So we, the model is the same, but of course there's some, some differences. Because when you want to stop playing with your dog, they don't hold any grudge. <laughs> and that is probably the most common thing when we ask them, well, what's the real advantage, is the, the idea that there's no judgment in my yeah, relationship with the animals. Right. And they're always happy when you You're come right. home. Right. <laughs> they're never mad. They never say, why did you get home so late? Or where have you been? Or what are you doing? They just say, yay, we're so happy you're home. You're here, you're here. One of my clients says that the best um, animals sort of make up where us humans sort of fail to be able to provide what we humans need from one another. Mm. Isn't that an interesting yeah. observation? I mean, I wouldn't want to think of my life without animals Absolutely. as a part of my life. I mean, it really adds substantially to my life, and I suspect you feel the same. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. And I hear people say, well, my pets are old, so I'm older, and my pets are old, so I probably won't get any more pets. And I always, mm -hmm. I always kid with them because I say, no, if you've been an animal lover, you're going to continue <laughs> to get more pets because you know the benefits that brings to your life. That's it, right. It may be for the older person that animal is actually a special important oh, as a focus of attention, as a mm -hmm. sort of stimulate sure. exercise and so mm -hmm. on. It'd be, be really nice if you can keep that available to That's you right. and not be afraid. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice for the elderly person who has really not a lot else mm -hmm. to really dote upon in their life to have that one animal that they can spoil rotten, if you will. Mm -hmm. That is probably a major role that animals play both for children and for the older person as a source of nurturing. Mm -hmm. This is where our children, especially boy children, really learn to be nurturers mm -hmm. because it's one of the few things boys can do that's still considered macho. That's mm -hmm. okay. Being taken yeah. care of. And for the older person, the, I, we're, we're a very nurturing group. We exactly. love caring. We, yeah. And that's an opportunity to, to do it. And I found that the one common thread of most, most of my clients is the need to be needed. Mm -hmm. Helps them go live sure. day by day. That's, sure. Yeah. That certainly makes sense. Are there differences between our ideal of how a pet should behave and be in our life and their nature as an animal? Yes. <laughs> and actually, this was the whole field of animal behavior trainers, obedience trainers, more and more veterinary schools have animal behavior clinics. We have a very active animal behavior clinic. And many times, the problem is just not understanding that while they are members of the family, they're animals. Mm -hmm. And a certain amount of understanding is, is required. Uh, and that's more education. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, one of the biggest predictors of people giving their animals up to shelters is how often they go to veterinarians, because that's how they learn to solve the little problems that lead to yeah. relinquishment. Yeah. Uh, so, and that's, if you look at who's turning animals into to shelters, they're not the puppies and kittens for which we are very tolerant. It's the one, two, and three-year-olds. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
it's those teenage years that are so <laughs> yeah. challenging. And I do want to come back and talk about that because if there's anything that we can provide in, in the way of advice to our viewers as to how to work through some of those problems because I really hate the thought of thinking right. of, a, of a pet being turned into a shelter. How do pets affect family dynamics? Peggy, how, how do the pets in your life affect your relationships? They are the center of my world, so they, of course, affect all of my relationships. Um, they affect your vacation plans. They affect your daily schedule. In fact, I'm one of, I tell people that I'm one of the few lawyers that they'll ever meet that actually start shoveling the proverbial you-know-what before they ever get to the <laughs> office. Um, so that's how all my days start. So they do affect all of your relationships. But even in my office, if you were to come visit, there are pictures of my animals all over my office. So the minute anybody walks in, they immediately know the type of person they're dealing with and how that person is probably going to interact with them. And I'm sure our audience has enjoyed seeing the pictures of your dogs and your filly. Since I brought it up, tell us a little bit about how you acquired your filly. She came from a Canadian slaughterhouse auction. She was bred on what's known as a Premarin farm. And Premarin is a female hormone replacement therapy, so for menopausal women. There's a drug called Premarin, and it is made from pregnant mare urine, hence the name. And uh, the byproduct of this process of collecting this urine is unwanted foals, so baby horses. And tens of thousands, and in fact the estimates are in the 40 to 50,000 50, animals a year are sent to slaughter oh. from these Premarin farms. And so she came from one of those farms out of Canada and there was a gal in Daytona Beach, Florida, who sent up a rescue truck, basically, and brought back 120 of these foals and then auctioned them off at a local fairground. And I happened to be there that day just looking and um, came home with a baby. Oh, <laughs> wonderful story. And did all of them get homes? They were all adopted that day. The saddest part for me was that there were some foals there that were extremely young. Um, they looked like they shouldn't even have been taken away from their no. mothers yet. And of course, they're all terrified. Um, they're all within the you know, ages of maybe two to five months of age, so all young. Isn't that even a common problem in pet stores, that they have puppies and cute little kittens? Uh, it's a little bit too early for them to have been taken from their, their mother. Well, sometimes I'm sure that that's true. Yeah. Well, last question that I have. How do pets affect the family dynamics? And then we'll take a break and we'll come on back. The, uh, actually, pet, if you think of it as a hobby, is one of the most wonderful hobbies because it involves the whole family. Yeah. And it gets every, everybody involved. It helps you know, the share responsibility. We did a study with Gail Melson, who's a child development person with me, at giving uh, uh, bird feeders to, to families. And the siblings, everybody got into it because it's a nice focus. We mm -hmm. care about nature. We care about animals. It, it goes across all the age groups. And it's a way of the whole family doing something together. You go to dog shows, they're really, unlike other hobbies like yeah. golf or something where mm -hmm. you just do it, <laughs> the whole family goes. Mm -hmm. What is it like for a family bringing in a six or eight <coughs> week old puppy? Everybody's excited with the, the new baby. Mm -hmm. and everybody until, <laughs> until the, the <laughs> training <laughs> begins. <laughs> and the dog chews up the first slipper. Yes. <laughs> then it's quite a different story. Well, we need to take a break, so I'm going to ask our viewing audience to stay tuned, and we'll be right on back. So thank you. They came from every corner of the country from small towns and big cities. But they all shared one thing in common. They belonged to a family called Marines, a tough and determined few dedicated to protecting everything we hold sacred. And still, they come. Celebrate the 225 year history of those proud few who have earned the title Marine. This is the story about a group of kids who volunteered. Do something nice for someone. We fixed stuff. Did some art projects with the kids. We fixed up this house. We worked in the woods. Cleaned up the park. Did something for the planet. We just did it. No other reason. And you know what? It was great. At first, they didn't know each other. 
Well, that didn't last long. This guy is really funny. Me? These are my new friends. Are you into it? Call 4 H or check out our website at areyouintoit.com. Kids aren't afraid of other kids. Or people with different color skin. That's because kids know there are other things. Worse things. Bigger things to be afraid of. Like monsters from outer space! Remember, friends come in all colors. Before you know it, she talks. Before you know it, she walks. Before you know it, she knows you. Before you know it, she has a heart. Before you know you're pregnant, when your baby's no bigger than a grain of rice. Before she's a twinkle in your eye, that's when you need to take folic acid every day. After that, it's too late to prevent some serious birth defects. Folic acid now, before you know it. Welcome back to the Educational Forum. We're discussing people and their pets. Dr. Beck, many studies have shown that while it's believed that we're taking care of our pets, they're really, in fact, taking care of us. How do people benefit from pet ownership? Well, when we relate to a pet, we're actually more relaxed because mm -hmm. of all it, its feedback to us. So we, we, we know that there's actually a drop in blood pressure and so people, when talking to their pet, unlike talking to people, are actually more relaxed. Uh, other studies have shown that this sort of general relaxation might explain why pet owners in general have actually some lower cholesterol levels. They do uh, survive after heart attacks more. It may be because there's a general morale boost. So that's part of it. We know dog owners walk more. They actually walk more frequently and take longer walks. So that we, we know that's good. We know those animals that are a focus of attention, like fish and, and birds, are used by people whenever they feel a little tense. They come home, mm -hmm. the first thing they want to do is, I'll, I'll, I'm going to check on the fish tank. It's a way of just letting things go. I, I think all of us have a uh, sort of natural uh, interest in nature. Mm -hmm. uh, we all go to sunsets. We all talk about the biophilia hypothesis. We're, we're animals. We, we like being part of nature. For, for our animals, it's nature on, on demand. So you have a fish tank for water, you could, you could sit with your pet, and you have all that immediate feedback that we have when we're dealing with, with nature. So it, there are really, it's, it's, it's almost predictable. If you look at how we relate to animals, it would be very hard to explain if it wasn't good for you. Peggy, how do you believe that you benefit physically or emotionally from from your pets? Well, physically, I get a lot of exercise, as <laughs> Dr. Beck said. Um, I get a lot of physical exercise from taking care of the horses, not mm -hmm. just the physical day-to-day -day feeding and, and cleaning up after them, but riding them on a regular basis. I walk all three of my dogs every morning, about a mile or a mile and a half, and I don't know if I'm walking them or they're walking me, <laughs> but um, my neighbors can probably attest to the fact that they're mostly walking me. Um, so I think there are a lot of physical benefits that way. And then, of course, if you're ever feeling sad, I mean, all you have to do is go collect up one of your dogs or your cats and kind of cry into their shoulder, mm -hmm. and they're always happy to be that shoulder. <laughs> Kayun, I'm sure a lot of your clients have their lives extended because they Absolutely. have pets because I think they're they're afraid to die because they don't want to leave their pets. Oh, absolutely, so. absolutely. And they add to their quality of life. Yes. And how so about crucial. yourself personally? You have two very lovable dogs. Yes, I have two pit bulls and they are the joy of my life and um, certainly they add to the physical benefits and as well as emotional benefits. Um, they've lived through quite a few boyfriends <laughs> through my lifetime <laughs> so uh, I, you know can imagine my life without them. Absolutely. Now, how is it that you acquired pit bulls who have such a horrible reputation? Oh, probably because I always have to root for the underdog. <laughs> so um, they have a bad reputation, but certainly by no means are all pit bulls, you know, bad dogs. Are bad dogs. Um, you know, you can go and look at any breed and you'll find a bad dog mm -hmm. amongst any breed. So um, it just kind of happened um, where I ended up with my first one who have, I've had for like 10 when he was 10 weeks old and he's now 11. Years old, yes. wow. And my youngest who is now five and a half and I've had him since he was just 
a tiny, tiny puppy as well. So. And they add to your life in a substantial way. Oh, in way. a priceless way. That's wonderful. Way. Dr. Beck, I read when I was researching for the show, um, actually one of our librarians, Mary Kilpatrick, did all the work on the show. And one of the studies she brought to my attention was the studies that suggest that there is a great link between depression and fighting depression and pet ownership. Do you have any comments? We, we know that, that one of the ways of dealing with, with depression is getting yourself out of this, this mindset, finding sources of joy. And we intuitively find joy in dealing with animals. It breaks right through depression because it's just part of our system. Mm -hmm. uh, we did uh, a, a study with Alzheimer's patients where, whose uh, biggest problem is they have no attention span, so they weren't eating well, they don't sit through the whole meal. Right. Nothing would hold their attention but fish tanks because, again, our, uh, our interest in nature is so real, mm -hmm. it survives dementia. And I suspect our interest in, in animals survived depression. So it's a wonderful way of getting people to sort of refocus on positive things, perhaps starting to think about positive parts of their life, mm -hmm. because very often our relationships with animals were associated with, with nicer times. It also facilitates people talking together. That's another way of getting out of depression. And so you have something else to talk about than just your problems, but let's <laughs> yeah. tell me about your animal. Tell that me about that animal. is for sure. Right. The stories are endless. Right. <laughs> Now, health benefits such as reduction for the chance of stroke, heart disease, how do animals impact that? Just, again, by all the little things that animals do, by just improving our, our whole sense of morale, by giving us a sort of sense of purpose. And then these little things like exercise mm -hmm. when, when you have an animal, like facilitating interacting with other people, which again feeds back to make you a little better person. Mm -hmm. So all the things make, make very, very good sense. Uh, we, somehow when we relate to animals, it just so holds our attention that we have a real relaxation response. Mm -hmm. And being able to slow down and relax helps you no matter what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Just look at the way we talk to our animals. We talk to them in ways that must relax you <laughs> because we talk slower and lower but with slightly higher pitch. Hmm. If we could talk that way all the time, we would all be happy. <laughs> I know my law students would be a lot happier <laughs> if I talked to them like I do my dogs. <laughs> How are pets used in therapy, in, in therapy situations? As therapy dogs, I've seen that. As animals in, in nursing homes? And, yes. and what, if you think about it, the therapy situation is really nothing more than, than the benefits of, mm -hmm. of animal ownership to a situation where it's not there, exactly. where some of those benefits are particularly important. Mm -hmm. So the therapy animal is not mm -hmm. doing anything more than the animal's doing in your house, mm -hmm. okay. but these people particularly can use it mm -hmm. because they're, it, it, so it really, not only is it a focus of attention, something a nurturing which you don't have in a, in a therapeutic setting, yeah. uh, but it's a way of, of the whole community working together, all the exact same things, mm -hmm. it very concentrated because that's what you needed the most. Right. And it's an environmental stimulation mm -hmm. in a situation like in a nursing home where, where things are somewhat monotonized, very routine. Again, it's just something new to do. And one of the things that, that many people now have noticed, when you interact in a therapeutic environment, the staff now sees you as a person, yeah. not a patient. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it just helps the whole relationship mm -hmm. better because it reminds that caretaker, who is also under incredible stress, that, you know, you're a person, you, they, for the first time they see you talking, they see you smiling, mm -hmm. it reminds them maybe they talk to you about their animal, and you start developing a relationship. And that's the best way to get out of any kind of depression, mm -hmm. is having normal relationships with other people. It's interesting, just yesterday one of my, my, my colleagues, her mother-in-law is in a nursing home and has been moved up to this, this area and had a cat which they've taken in now into their family to take care of the cat, but once a week they put it in the little cat carrier and they go into the nursing sure. home. Sure. It's really, just really wonderful. Pets on wheels. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my sister has a Jack Russell that's trained as a therapy dog and he loves to fetch a ball and he'll in fact he'll do it all day long mm -hmm. and the older people just love to throw that ball for him and he's yeah, so, so excited good. to bring it back and the one thing they had to train him to do specially was to put the ball in a hand that was mm -hmm. lower you mm -hmm. know if a person was sitting in a wheelchair and um, of course Jack Russell's are very smart that way and very quick to adapt and so 
he just loves to go to the nursing home and the people that are used to seeing him there, they just really look forward to his visits. Wow. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that a dog such as that would be very useful with children. Sure. Absolutely. You know, children with a number of different disabilities. Mm -hmm. I often think when I go into housing for the mentally retarded or the mentally ill or the elderly, wouldn't it be wonderful within that house, mm -hmm. among all of the people that are residents there, if they could have at least one pet, yeah. that would be a wonderful thing. My That's oldest actually just got certified as a therapy dog and I'm starting my internship in the fall at a oh. mental institution where are he'll be really? going in. And they're incorporating animal assisted therapy in the therapy session as it is and they've seen tremendous um, dramatic improvement within their patient right. populations. Within autistic children, I've heard of great results with horses, particularly, yeah. Yeah. Um, and the way they respond to those pets, and just seeing miraculous results where couldn't get the child to respond to anything, but bring it around mm -hmm. a horse, and suddenly it's interacting with the world again. Wow. Mm -hmm. Therapeutic riding is actually becoming exactly. very well established. Mm -hmm. There's about 500 set, uh, programs in the, in mm -hmm. the United States. Are they really? Winnipeg, yeah. There's okay. 20 in Indiana alone. Wow. And not only it, it's one, it's a great way of stimulating for sure. exercise because it's actually a much better therapeutic intervention because it's so three dimensional. Mm -hmm. But like in, in our program, it's also the opportunity for the handicapped child to deal mm -hmm. with a, a normal sibling. Mm -hmm. And they've got riding together. It's one of the exactly. few sports they can do together. Mm -hmm. So it really socializes the whole family. The whole and normalizing effect yeah. again. Yeah. Do a lot of people still own horses? If you live in my neighborhood, you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, it seems like there's an incredible number of people that still own horses. Well, that's good to hear. <laughs> Up here in the you know north, we don't see an awful lot of horses, and I don't know if that's a result of of the climate or the fact that you know people are just less inclined to make that kind of a commitment. Uh, unlike our pocket pets, you have, <laughs> have a, a commitment of, of money that's and space big, that you don't. That's a big have. island. <laughs> A troubling issue for many people is the loss of their pet because people are reluctant to let other knows, other people know just how, how sad they are. And so there's no way for them to really mourn the loss of that pet. Advice that you might have for our audience as how you get through the loss of a pet? I think there's more and more a, a recognition that it's okay and people are beginning to understand it. It's true. 20 years ago, if you started crying at a party because you lost your animal, mm -hmm. they said, well, let's get another animal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now they would understand it. It's funny, because had you said you, you wrecked your good car, they would understand it. Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, and there are some really wonderful books out there. I think more and more social workers and psychologists, psychiatrists are seeing that it is a very much like the true grief response. Mm -hmm. It's much shorter than our loss of a person because it doesn't quite change your life quite as much but the response is just as real mm -hmm. and has to be recognized as mm -hmm. such. And I think we're beginning to become a more sophisticated society. Mm -hmm. Even if you walk through Hallmark, there are cards for yeah. Yeah. pet loss. Well, and, and I think Dr. Beck is right. I think it's finally being recognized that we go through the same stages of grief Absolutely. in mourning a pet that we would mourning the loss of a family member. Mm -hmm. And it might be a shorter period of time, yeah. but we've seen some people who, you know, just can't yeah. let go. I mean, it's right. been such a horrible experience to mm -hmm. lose their beloved pet. I had a cat that lived to be 21 years old, and I just knew in my heart that the day that I was going to lose him was going to be one of the worst possible days of my life. And, and in fact, it was, but at the same time, I was ready because he had lived a long, healthy mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. And, but I think, you know, getting that that next pet to love is also helpful yeah. for somebody, but that's often a hard commitment to make sure once you've just lost a beloved pet. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to memorialize the loss of a pet? Oh, sure. There's lots of things we can do to memorialize the loss of our pet. Um, not the least of which is we can support our local pet organizations and mm -hmm. charities. Um, there's many organizations that now have programs that honor the memory of a pet. I know the Humane Society of the United States has a kindred spirits program. Um, many universities, yeah. such as Purdue, Purdue University, University, Cornell has a program, are offering programs to memorialize pets. Um, but there's things we can do on a personal level too. We can we can hold a service for our pet, mm -hmm. and and that may be particularly important if you have small children in a family mm -hmm. um, to just recognize that passing as a significant event in the family. Um, I cremated two of my pets, and so I have their ashes in a special place in my house. 
Um, and I, I haven't chosen to bury those cremains because I want to have them accessible if mm -hmm. I need to take them to another home where I might live someday. Mm -hmm. um, People have made videos, they've made memory books. Those mm -hmm. creative memory books are really wonderful for memorializing pets. People have written songs, made videos, all kinds of things. Is cloning an option, Dr. Beck? <laughs> <laughs> it is probably possible, but I, and I think it maybe as a research tool it might be very interesting. Uh, is it a way of uh, helping you deal with the, the, your beloved animal? No. In fact, it may be a very cruel way of dealing with it because the cloned animal is different. Mm -hmm. right. The animal that you know is not only just the, 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 the genetic materials, but it is the behaviors and experiences of its whole life, mm -hmm. none of which is part of the cloned exactly. animal. Right. The soul isn't there. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when you start dealing with the animal, which just from natural variation will be different, you're really you're going to be disappointed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. well, maybe it's better to really appreciate that animal that you've had, and when you're ready for another animal, start a new relationship. Not forgetting about the other mm -hmm. one, but it'll always be part of your pictures, your memories, mm -hmm. but now you have a new relationship. If, it's, if you were really into the same breed, fine, but even that's not necessary. It's better to have a new relationship. Mm -hmm. And by the way, even when they clone cats, they all came out with different colors. <laughs> <laughs> True. We've talked about the situation in which you lose a pet, but Peggy, let's begin our conversation about providing for our pets in the event that they outlive us. And, and that's such an important topic because we often rely on the fact that we think a family member or a loved one will be more than willing to take care yeah. of our pets. And I think the reality there is exactly the opposite. Um, husbands and wives cannot necessarily be relied upon to take care of spouses' pets. Um, family members may have other issues going on in their lives. They may have pets that are not compatible with our pets. Our pet may not be um, a desirable pet from the standpoint that it may be old, it may be infirm, um, may have personality traits or behavioral issues that people are not willing to take on. Or in my case, it might be horses. And people may <laughs> not be willing to accept that commitment of time, energy, money, et cetera. Um, so really creating a plan, and whether it's something as simple as a non-legal plan or whether somebody wants to take it to the extent of creating a legal plan, a plan is absolutely necessary. Just tremendous advice. In the minute or so before we take our next break, let me ask you, what does a person do to provide for their pet in an emergency situation? For example, a temporary illness. We recommend that you do have identified caregivers, people that would be willing to step in, and then also, from a legal perspective, um, authorizing an individual with a veterinary power of attorney so that they could make veterinary decisions for your pet in your absence. So if you don't do this and you become ill and hospitalized and something's the matter, with your pet, the veterinarian may not be willing to do an operation or perform Clearly. some other service. Wow, that's something I had never even thought about. Further comments? Um, I, it's, it's such a tough situation. I, I just recently had an emergency with a client who was hospitalized and his dogs were in the basement for a few days wow. with no, nobody to provide care for him. And he was too sick to be able to have the mental capacity to make those necessary decisions as to, you know, pinpoint or somebody. To, or to be able to telephone somebody. Exactly. And it wasn't after the fact that I knew about the emergency. Right. Yeah. And now this is where the MSPCA would step in and provide the, assistance. Yes. The Finney's friends would jump in and provide So a care. wonderful service. Mm -hmm. Is it limited to individuals who are suffering with but HIV? It, yes. Unfortunately, at this point in time, we're not equipped to handle a broader scope of um, Are you hoping that someday yes, you will? Absolutely. Oh, that absolutely. would be such a wonderful service. Well, panel, we need to take another break, and we'll be right back. And at this point, we'll talk about some of the, the sad issues, all the unwanted dogs and cats that are in animal shelters. So please stay with me, and to our viewing audience, we'll be right back. Thank you. how inquisitive kids are. That's why you store sharp objects in a safe place. Keep medicines out of reach. 
And if you have a gun, you keep it unloaded and locked away. As concerned members of the television community, we urge you to be just as careful with television. Kids don't always know what they're watching. That's why you should. Every time an adult gives up on our kids, every time we surrender to the belief that their future is out of our hands, another child is left behind. I'm General Colin Powell, and I don't believe in giving up. That's why I'm asking you to join America's Promise. Log on to americaspromise.org or give us a call. Whoever you are, wherever you are, you can do something important. Pull your weight. They won't leave you for someone younger. They won't notice you've gained weight. They won't fire you. They won't talk about you behind your back. All they'll ever do is love you. Find the love of your life. Visit PetFinder at ASPCA.org. You wouldn't consider dancing with me, would you? I'd consider it. Then I'd say no. I'm not much of a dancer, but... No. You know, I wouldn't blame you if you said... No. Would you like to no. dance with... First, you don't succeed. You're pretty normal. From the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Welcome back to the Educational Forum. We're discussing the relationship of people and their pets. Piano, let's go to the harder subject. Humane Society estimates four to five million cats and dogs are euthanized annually in shelters. How do we reconcile the love and devotion that so many of us feel for our pets with the fact that there are all these unwanted pets? I think a very important thing is to uh, get the message out to the public um, that it's so important to spay and neuter your pets. Spay and neuter. Why are people reluctant to do that? That's common sense. <laughs> you, would <laughs> <Sorry. think. laughs> you would think, but it, it's, you know, People is it the money, $35, or maybe it's much more now, but... It's a little bit more, and I know with the MSPCA we have a program that helps people who can't afford it to get that service done for their animals. Um, it's just a reluctance on society's part. It's, um, Some of it may be education, and there's still probably a, a growing number of people out there that say, oh, wouldn't it be great to have a litter of pup or puppies Absolutely. or a litter of kittens? and not recognizing that all of those pets now need to have homes. Mm -hmm. um, or there's, you know, feral cat communities um, mm -hmm. in a lot of areas that just continue to grow without a good spay and neuter program. And, and cats can just multiply at incredibly fast rates. So I think education's part of it, just continuing to educate the public about the importance of spay and neutering our pets. Dr. Beck? Well, spay and neutering is, is part of the answer. But it is, I think, we, we, there's been too much focusing on it as the only answer, which is why we still have the problem. Uh, people still want dogs and cats when they're very young. Mm -hmm. People are not keeping their animals. It is relinquishment that is the problem. Why? And uh, lots of reasons. They, through lack of, of proper education, they, know how, they do not how understand you know, mm -hmm. basic behavior problems, so they get frustrated as it gets older. Uh, they're not reinforcing, they're not reinforced for being good uh, owners. Mm -hmm. So it becomes just one of those hobbies. Uh, we, uh, Gary Petronic at Tufts showed that if you go to veterinarians at least once or twice a year, you almost, you're much less likely to relinquish either animal because you've been rewarded for, for doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, you've been able to solve some of the problems, perhaps puppy classes, so you mm -hmm. get, again, you find friends who have it, so now you really are sort of committed to the animal. So your threshold for tolerance changes, as well as your ability to, ch to solve the problems. So that is, I think, you know, a very big part, is, is having society recognizing that this is a legitimate hobby and we should stop fighting it. Mm -hmm. So let people uh, be more friendly to keep animals in housing. Let's have dog parks mm -hmm. so they can meet other people mm -hmm. who have animals, can solve some of their problems of walking their, their dogs. We do this for other interests. I mean, we have golf, which is a, 
serves a very small population if you think a of horrible it. Horrible waste of time. Well, and and <laughs> space. We have right. So we have you know, and it's it's good to have dedicated areas. You know, basketball courts and all that's fine. Mm -hmm. But with 62 percent of the households having a companion animal, we should actually help people. You know, solve their problems and support this hobby. That's right. You know, you go to the beach, big sign, no dogs. Everywhere you go, it seems like, right. you know, no animals, no animals. And I can't imagine what one does if you are looking for an apartment dwelling and, and you have a big dog. I mean, some a a dog at all, period, but right. a big dog, certainly. I don't know what one does. Right. And that was always an issue for me because I always had dogs, I always had cats. And as a result, I never lived in an apartment. I always had to rent a house or buy a house so that I could make those decisions about having my pets with me. Um, one of the things that probably makes me crazier than anything is people <laughs> who move from one location to another and because of that move make a decision that they can't take their yes. pet oh, with them. Boy. Yes. And of course there's another relinquishment problem, problem. Mm -hmm. um, that the humane societies and shelters are forced to deal with. And I know they hear that frequently, well I'm moving and I just can't take my pet. Um, that's an issue I don't understand. That's but. unacceptable. Well, we have to aggressively help people get interested in older animals, not just puppies and kittens. And we're, we're beginning to do that. And many people, if they are going to give up their pet, get their pet to a shelter. But so many just turn them to the streets. What do we do about all the unwanted pets that are on the streets? How do we solve that? Can we solve that? It, it through the since most of these are just loose pets, you've got to really just change people's attitudes and their commitment to, the, to their animal, including, if necessary, giving it uh, at least to a, a, a system that can take care of it, or, if necessary, you mainly put it down. You're right. Uh, it's just a matter of, of helping people better understand their responsibilities, and we're beginning to do that. I mean, we're actually becoming a, a somewhat better society. I think there still exists a misconception, though, that a person thinks, well, if I take it to the shelter, they'll find a home for it. Yeah. And, I mean, I've worked with rescue organizations. This gal said, this lady called her one day and said, I have this 14-year-old cat who has diabetes, requires, you know, daily shots. Would you please take it? And the, the rescue lady says, I have 56 cats for adoption right now. Why do you think that we need this particular cat that has special needs? Um, and so I think it's just a misconception, too, on some people's parts that if they simply give this animal to a rescue organization, that they're going to somehow miraculously find a home for it. Or if they leave the pet off in a certain area, or someone for sure will take it home and take care of it. I don't, that's not realistic. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, one of my two dogs I adopted, quote, off the streets. Mm -hmm. You know, why, did, why was he on the streets? Probably because he gets up with the sun. So if you're not an early riser, it's an inconvenience. But you know, that's minimal. What can people do to solve some of the more common problems with pets, such as inappropriate elimination, barking, aggression? How should people deal with those issues? obedience training and, mm -hmm. and as soon as you get an animal just sort of get yourself involved with either a humane society that has uh, obedience programs mm -hmm. a lot of private uh, trainers do it uh, all the veterinary schools do it and just really get into it if it's your hobby let's learn to do it right exactly. and you'll find it a lot of fun mm -hmm. uh, and just and reinforce it mm -hmm. uh, because I think if people really know that you could do it and there's a great reward and it's like anything you can do when you do it when, when you finally do it well you feel good about it the animal appreciates it and you appreciate it that's right Peggy certainly you've had pets along the way that have been less than perfect how did you deal with it well if you are committed to that pet and you're committed to a lifelong relationship then that's part of the commitment I mean even if they are less than perfect one of my <laughs> Mustangs Reno um, we call him an extremely large yard ornament because <laughs> he really is not suitable for riding and he has some health issues. But, you know, we made a commitment to that horse and we can't imagine doing anything but taking care of him because nobody would love him the way that we love him. Mm -hmm. So even though he's not a desirable animal, somebody else wouldn't want him if you put him up for adoption necessarily. He's stubborn, he's hard-headed, he falls down when you ride him. I mean, he's got all these issues. Sounds like me. <laughs> <laughs> he's still, he's our commitment, and, and we feel that way about all of our animals. Um, mm -hmm. Good, bad, or otherwise, they're ours, and we're committed to them for life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
you know, in today's throwaway society, it's hard, but I, I wish that people, when they took in a pet, could say, this is a lifetime commitment the day we take it take it in. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe a lot of people don't realize that. I mean, especially in the bird communities, my goodness, some of those birds can live 50 or 75 or 100 years. And although I can imagine making a commitment to a horse for 30 or 35 years, I can't imagine a commitment of 50 or 60 or 75 years. And then if you've got a bird with behavioral problems, then you've got more trouble on your hands. <laughs> and what is it, turtles? They live forever yeah, almost? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, well, you can deal with their behavior <laughs> problems fairly well, easily, though. Is there a difference when a person adopts a pet from a breeder versus a shelter versus a pet store? Do you have any comments on? Actually, uh, again, from the, the Gary Patronic studies and some of the others, uh, it's not as much as people thought. Like even gifts are very, they, they stay in, in families because people really cared about them. Mm -hmm. Pet shop animals actually, once they're there, actually have good uh, histories of staying there. Mm -hmm. There's a slight problem, of course, animals from humane societies because very often they've had behavior problems, mm -hmm. which is how they got there. Mm -hmm. And if, it's not a, if you don't have that commitment to, to address that, it becomes another relinquishment. You give it back. Uh, but the source of animal is actually not as important as people thought it was. It's the commitment once you have it mm -hmm. and, and how to solve some of those problems. It's interesting. My brother and sister-in-law adopted a Rottweiler who was five years old from a shelter. And even I was a little concerned about that. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking five years old in a shelter, Rottweiler, wow. Sweetest dog of any dog I have ever met. So you never know. Sure. Mm -hmm. You never know. Mm -hmm. Depends on the dog. What kinds of things should people consider before they adopt a pet? What advice would you give them? I would suggest they look at their expectations, their lifestyle, if they have a family or not, kids, um, their other animals if they have them in the household. Um, so there's a whole list of things to look at. And it certainly would seem to me, for example, if somebody is adopting a dog, well, take a look at the characteristics of the breed. Um, if somebody is adopting a cat, perhaps the mm -hmm. same thing, because a Siamese might be different than a tabby. Mm -hmm. Well, and they talk about right after 101 Dalmatians came out, how many people <laughs> went out and got Dalmatians. Mm -hmm. And Dalmatians are not necessarily the breed for every household. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that the, the shelter saw a lot of relinquishment issues on, on Dalmatians at, during that period of time. And, and so you always kind of hesitate any time a movie comes out that promotes a particular breed. <laughs> That's right. That, that may be become the next, you know, mm -hmm. pet of the day kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And a good thing to remember is that very often people are getting their animal because they think it's good for their children, which is it is. That's the most common reason. It's good for the, pet, uh, for the children, which is a good time to remember that children have the ability to relate much more than we can uh, to different animals. And so maybe the dog and cat is not the right mm -hmm. choice, but the gerbil, the hamster, mm -hmm. uh, right. fish tank. Yes. Uh, because it takes us, we adults, a little bit more interaction to really relate to another animal. But you, you talk to children and they're talking everything from their hermit crabs <laughs> to their gerbils, <laughs> with the fine. same way we talk to our golden retrievers. Mm -hmm. And they confide at even at a greater level than we do. And it's a way that perhaps you have the time to be a better manager mm -hmm. because the commitment isn't as much. Now, you should still be the, the main husbandry person, mm -hmm. but remind that, that there are really lots of other ways of, of fulfilling this need for the child to have a pet. Mm -hmm. Dr. Beck, in the remaining minutes, tell us what projects you're working on. Oh. <laughs> well, one major project uh, with, uh, with the help of the National Science Foundation was to see if some of our technological emulations of animals could serve some of the same roles. So we've, uh, we're looking at the Sony Ibo. It's a robotic dog. And we've been giving, <coughs> we've been giving this to, to older people who live in, in, in independent living facilities that can't have animals. These people had dogs in the past. Uh, and they have their, unfortunately, since we have to buy these, we can't give them for, to keep. But we give them to them for six weeks at a time. And they keep a log and, and all that. And we do six weeks before of interviews. And we're finding this emulation of a, of a dog allows people to relate to it as if it was a real dog, in many at least the same attributes, and is serving some of the same 
advantages. Mm -hmm. They talk to, they watch television with their eyebow, they socialize more, the grandkids want to come and play with it, of course. <laughs> uh, they, they often ask, and we give, give them a carry case so when they do go visiting, they can uh, take it with them. <laughs> oh, my. And if you ask them what's the main advantage, is that they can put it on the stand and they don't have any of the guilt of taking care of an animal. Mm -hmm. Because in their lifestyle, they're not quite ready to, to be mm -hmm. a full-time mm -hmm. animal caregiver. Mm -hmm. So when they have to go visiting or go for medical care, we can sit there with no guilt. It doesn't, <laughs> doesn't hurt at all. So that's just one example. And I think we have to start exploring our technological uses of nature, whether it be fish tanks, which we've been also doing in nursing homes with great success, bird feeders, maybe even just nice video programs about animals. Sure. To start getting people to start feeling good about themselves because they always cared about animals. The connection with the animal. Yeah. Yeah. Peggy, in the remaining two minutes or so, tell us a little bit about your practice. Part of my practice concentrates on helping people create legal plans for their pets, trust for your pets, if you will. And there are about 15 or 16 states in the nation now that actually recognize a trust for the benefit of a pet. And so what this really contemplates is creating a long-term care plan for your pet. What happens to my pet if something happens to me? And it could be dogs, it could be cats, it could be horses, it could be birds, it could be anything. And it could be anything from a non-legal plan to a sophisticated trust setup. Um, one client I have has 10 cats and 5 dogs and she has a very sophisticated plan for taking care of her pets. People that have horses often need sophisticated plans for their pets. So really just working with folks on developing plans that are going to provide for the long-term care of their pets so that they can make more than sure that those pets are well taken care of. Wonderful advice and peace mm. of mind and comfort because mm -hmm. I know personally it's an issue that I'm concerned about. So you'll probably get a call from me. Well, <laughs> you can always get more information at my website, www.legacyforyourpet.com. And there's lots of great information out there on planning for your pets. And Peggy, would you repeat that one more time for the audience? It's www.legacyforyourpet.com. Thank you, Peggy. Kayoon, final yes. comment? Um, I just wanted to put the word out there that for those who are immunocompromised, um, to have your he pets be healthy and get the yearly veterinary checkup is crucial because of all the zoonotic risks that may be involved in, uh, in their situations. Very good advice. Panel, thank you so much thank for being you. with thank me you. here today. You. You've been invaluable. I hope our audience has enjoyed the program. I know that I have. So to our viewing audience, until next time, be well and thanks for joining us.